The coronavirus is spreading, Pakistan being the latest to declare its first cases, and so is fear of the unknown. As governments urge people not to panic, there are the visible signs of it across Europe. In the empty supermarket shelves in northern Italy, in the hotels locked down and quarantined, in the sporting events and public gatherings cancelled. China remains the epicentre of the disease, with nearly 80,000 cases reported. But for the first time, new cases outside the country have exceeded new cases there. South Korea has the second largest number, with over 1,000 infected. In the Middle East, Iran still has the most cases, with others in Bahrain, Iraq, Kuwait and Oman. And now the first reported case in Latin America in Brazil. In Europe, Italy has the greatest number of people infected, with nearly 50% more cases reported in 24 hours. Several other European countries have announced their first infections, including Greece. In Tenerife, four cases have meant hundreds of holidaymakers are unable to travel home, whilst here, of the thousands tested, only 13 have caught the virus. Our international editor, Lindsay Hilson, reports on the global spread of coronavirus. Praying for the sick is a medieval ritual, but this virus is spreading by thoroughly modern means. Those at the Pope's Ash Wednesday audience today are amongst 50 million people who fly in and out of Rome annually from more than 230 places worldwide. Pope Francis says he feels close to those suffering from the virus and those who care for the sick. His doctors might advise him to limit contact. Older people and those with underlying conditions are most at risk. On the high-speed train from Rome to Milan, everyone is aware that there have been more than 370 cases and 12 deaths in Italy. Part of a trend in which, according to the World Health Organization, the number of new cases outside China now exceeds those within. Milan itself is very quiet as the authorities try to balance sensible containment with preventing panic. We should stay calm. There is no reason to be particularly afraid. As a doctor, the only advice I can give is to tell people who are more at risk, the elderly, those with pre-existing conditions, cancer or weak immune systems, to avoid going out. A WHO team is preparing to travel to Iran, where the authorities may have underreported the outbreak centred on the holy city of Qom. A statement from one of the shrines today said the material used to build it would deter the virus, a kind of magical thinking that may be less than helpful. This report went viral. The journalist says the situation in Qom is critical. They don't have enough doctors or medicines, and he begs the authorities to close off the city, even if it means food shortages. Next door in the Iraqi city of Najaf, they're worried that Iranian pilgrims will bring the virus with them. But they're also worried about no pilgrims coming at all because they depend on the income. Falling ill or losing your livelihood, what kind of choice is that? The number of Iranian visitors had exceeded 4,000 people per day, but now there is not a single visitor here and all the hotels are empty. Our major concern as hotel owners, and Iraqis in general, is the absence of a health infrastructure. The Iraqi health system is broken. The empty hotels of Najaf are the least of it. Container shipping from Asia to Northern Europe is down by about 50% since the virus emerged. That's a massive economic hit, not just for the shipping industry, but for Asian suppliers and for manufacturers elsewhere in the world. From uh, import of, of raw materials into China, there's been a, a, obviously a massive decrease in that because the factories have stopped or are just starting to recover now. So, and on the, the finished goods side of it, you've got um, empty containers, for example, in, in China, and you've got a shortage of containers in the States because the manufactured goods are not getting out of China and being transported around the world. So it's affecting all the supply chain. Air travel is down too, as people cancel or postpone trips good for the planet, maybe. A drastic way of reducing carbon emissions that no one could or would have planned. All over the world, they're disinfecting. Classrooms in Bangkok are getting the treatment. Trams in the North Korean capital, Pyongyang. Buses in Seoul. 
The WHO has not declared this a pandemic, saying that could amplify unnecessary fear and stigma, but it is encouraging such precautions. In Dublin, they've postponed the Six Nations rugby fixture between Italy and Ireland at the Aviva Stadium, one of several international sports events being delayed. And in the Philippines, they're sprinkling ash instead of smearing it on the foreheads of the faithful, avoiding contact. The head of the WHO said today that we can contain the virus, but the impact of the measures required is being felt across the world. Lindsay Hilsom there. Well, here the Health Secretary Matt Hancock told MPs that a wider public information campaign will be rolled out, insisting the government had a clear plan to contain, delay research and mitigate the coronavirus outbreak. Several schools have been closed across the UK after fears that children returning from skiing trips to northern Italy might have been infected. But what is the official advice? Here's Semyon Brown. For hundreds who work here with Chevron, the morning memo was work from home. As cases of COVID-19 build around Europe, Britain is bracing itself. Today, the government said they expect to see more cases here, but refused the shutdown of schools, calling it unnecessary. If anyone has been in contact with a suspected case in a childcare or an educational setting, no special measures are required while test results are awaited. There is no need to close the school or send other students or staff home. But some schools have done exactly that. Cranley School in Northwich has closed its doors this week after students with flu-like symptoms returned from a trip to affected regions like here in northern Italy. In an age of global tourism, COVID-19, commonly called coronavirus, has an international passport. So travellers from affected regions, those tested, or been in close contact with somebody tested positive, have been told to self-isolate. Public Health England say hundreds of people have already successfully done it. But what does it mean in practice? The government say it means to separate from those you live with, including your partner and children, in a private room with the door closed. If you can, use a separate toilet and bathroom. If not, have a rotor and clean thoroughly after use. The advice also suggests ordering food and groceries using online services. Only visit a doctor after a phone call and as standard, wash your hands regularly. The problem is that for those returning from outbreak zones like this, self-isolation is being applied differently by different individuals and institutions. Diego Gulo returned to the UK from an affected area in Italy. Whilst he is under self-isolation, he says his son was told to return to school. I'm fairly worried because if by any chance I am a carrier and if I infect my kids or if by any chance the kids going out, uh, for instance, my son going to school doesn't infect another uh, child or another teacher that might have another condition, you know, that would cause serious trouble. I think at the moment there is no uh, structural check being done on the population to ensure that there's definitely not an infection in each single individual. The Spanish island of Tenerife is popular with UK holidaymakers, but the COVID-19 outbreak means hundreds of guests at this hotel have found themselves in lockdown and in limbo. They've just recommended that we stay in our rooms and if they see us out for too long, they tell us to go back to them. But that's all we really know. We haven't really been given instructions about no, what to do. No, it's very, very vague. And whenever we, whenever we try and get more information out of them, they very much just say, we'll let you know, we'll let you know, you know, and, and obviously they never do. So Yeah, we have no... <laughs> so, uh, we have no our news is coming from outside of the hotel, not from inside of it. Despite the quarantine, this is now what the hotel buffet hall looks like. Back in the UK, this well-known face is now in self-isolation. Jon Snow must test his temperature twice daily, but it's the mental test of self-isolation that will be a challenge. I'm more frightened by having to live with myself for 14 days on my own than I am of the virus, to be honest. For now, as the cases grow, this man is under pressure to get the public health response right. With the global death toll rising, the consequences for getting it wrong could be fatal.
Well, joining me now is Dr Richard Darwood, who's a travel health specialist at the Fleet Street Clinic, and Professor Azra Ghani, an infectious disease epidemiologist at Imperial College London. Professor Azra Ghani, first, how cautious do you think people need to be if you've got no symptoms mm -hmm. but you're still self-isolating for whatever reason? How do you have to lock yourself in your room or can you go out for a walk as long as you're not contacting people? Sure. So, so this is a precautionary measure, really, to try to stop the further spread of anybody who might potentially be infected. So as you say, if you have no symptoms, you really have no cause for concern. Um, but if you have travelled to one of the affected areas and could have been exposed, it's really a, a public health measure to try and um, contain the outbreak from spreading further. So is it a kind of moral duty to try and prevent the spread to the very small minority who face fatal consequences? Or is this really overcautious, this self-isolating business? So the principle behind it is to stop person-to-person -person spread to the extent that this uh, virus might um, become commonplace in the community. So we're in a phase, as the Health Secretary said, of containment, trying to identify cases, uh, especially people who've been uh, coming in from uh, areas with a higher rate of infection and to stop person-to-person -person contact that might allow the virus to become established. I think there's a distinction. Uh, I think it's very easy for people to become uh, obsessed with images of people wearing masks and hazmat suits and taking uh, what seem to be fairly draconian precautions. This is a public health exercise. We don't want the virus to establish itself uh, in the community. It's not because this is a dreadful, fearsome virus on the same scale as Ebola or SARS or some of the other more serious uh, outbreaks. So if, yeah. and it might be a when, this does mm. become established here, there's no point wearing the masks and self-isolating, is that right? There's very little scientific evidence to suggest that a mask will protect you as such. But certainly for those who have very strong symptoms and maybe a, a sort of cold symptoms, it may protect onward from onward transmission. But the evidence is quite patchy and really, in that particular case, if you have symptoms, just like if you had flu, mm. you are really better off staying at home. But if, as you say, you know, th this is not like Ebola, you know, we've got that clear, is it overcautious then to be closing schools in this country, to be cancelling sporting fixtures all over well, the world? Well, at the moment, there's no uh, scientific justification for doing that. So I, I would certainly caution people uh, against overreacting and taking, you know, putting in place measures that have no chance of being effective. There's not enough, uh, you know, so far we've got 13 cases in, in the UK. Shutting down sporting events in the UK um, will not make any difference mm. as things stand. Obviously, the situation may evolve differently and, and you know, and, and we rely on uh, the science, we rely on, on the magnificent work that is being done from uh, units like Professor Ghani's Do you to agree actually with model uh, what's, you know, to model the effect of different interventions. Yes, I mean, ab absolutely. Um, we consider all these different impacts and as the Health Secretary said today, if there is spread in the UK, then we may ultimately be moving to a phase of mitigation. And that's really where these, essentially what we call social isolation measures might come into place. That's not, of course, complete isolation. That's just reducing contact. And one of the clear ways you can do that is perhaps just stay a little bit further away from people. Stop the handshakes. Stop the handshakes well, and, and good hygiene. So when you've had dozens of countries now affected, you've got person-to-person -person transmission in multiple countries. Why do you think that a pandemic hasn't been declared? And would it be helpful if it was? Well, the, the, uh, the situation may change. At the moment, out of the 30 or so countries where the coronavirus has been found, um, the vast majority have got cases that number in, uh, you know, single or double digits only. So there's not um, a lot of evidence that the virus is becoming established in those countries. But it's increasing uh, faster outside it, China. Well, it, it, it is. It, we know that there's been travel from China. Some of the cases mm -hmm. that have been recorded are people who've been evacuated from China. Mm -hmm. So they're not, they've not been let loose in the community. Well, to me, what's much more worrying is where you hear about what's happening in Iran, for example, where instead of um, uh, ha cases being identified, 
you've got deaths being identified before the cases, which suggests to me that the public health infrastructure there is really not up to it. Would it be helpful, particularly in developing countries, for a pandemic to be declared by the WHO? Um, I, actually, I think it's just a term, and it probably isn't going to make what we do different. Um, so those countries are really at risk because of the weaker health systems, the poorer surveillance, and therefore that is of major concern. And really the focus should be on trying to contain and mitigate any impact of this as far as possible to protect um, both our, those in our own country, but also uh, the wider world. Professor Azraghani and Dr Richard Darwood, thank you both thank for you. joining me. Matt. Thanks, Catherine. In the United States, President Trump has laid into the media, accusing them of fueling fears about the coronavirus and insisting that his administration was doing a great job. He's due to hold a press conference later today. Let's go over to our Washington correspondent, Siobhan Kennedy. Siobhan, tell us more. Well, Donald Trump, Matt, is under pressure from criticisms that his administration simply isn't doing enough to cope if there's a sudden increase in cases here in the US. To be fair, so far the numbers are pretty low. About 60 citizens in total have been affected. The majority of those were rescued from that cruise ship in Japan and the rest are Americans who have flown back here from disease infected, virus infected areas. They are all either in quarantine or in hospital. Nobody has died. Uh, so, so far the numbers are low but the panic does appear to be rising we saw that in the stock market this week which fell more than a thousand points on two consecutive days and then yesterday the center for disease control really dialed up the rhetoric with a fresh warning let's hear from one of its officials now hear what she had to say now it's not so much a question of if this will happen anymore, but rather more a question of exactly when this will happen and how many people in this country will become infected and how many of those will develop severe or more, dif uh, more uh, complicated disease. Well, Donald Trump did not appreciate that. He's gone into defensive mode on Twitter, as you said earlier. He's blaming journalists for panicking the markets. And he's insisting that the US, he says, is doing a great job with respect to coronavirus. We know he's requested that two and a half billion dollars be set aside, though the Democrats say that's not nearly half enough. We'll hear the latest, Matt, as you said, in that press conference that the president himself is hosting in the White House in just over three hours time.